2,000 pound bombs are usually stacked only in one tier. Before the lorry and trailer arrive, see that the battens are correctly aligned. Lay out the ropes in position on either side of the ramp. One end of each rope must be attached to rings provided and embedded at the base of the ramp. It is essential that the rope be firmly secured. A slip knot is one of the safest. Before driving in, the lorry sides must be let down. The lorry is then driven into position for offloading. The floor of the lorry being a few inches higher than the concrete ramp, it will be found necessary to build up to this height by means of a wooden auxiliary ramp. Next, the tarpaulin and chocks are removed. The bomb is then rolled to the edge of the ramp and chocks are inserted. The bomb is now in a position to have the ropes passed round the bomb one and a half turns. Pass the rope under, not over. Chock the second bomb securely. This is very important. Remove chock. The two men on the lorry take the strain as the bomb is released onto and down the ramp. If this is carefully done, there is absolute control and safety. You will see that the ropes are at times almost slack. The main things to remember are, one, see that ropes are in good condition. Two, loop rope from front, under and round. Remember, under and round. To demonstrate ease of handling, here is one man letting down the bomb with very little effort. Notice that he can even check the bomb quite easily in its descent. It's as easy as that. After the bomb has been rolled onto the battens, it is moved along to the end of the ramp and firmly chopped. Note that all bombs should, in normal circumstances, lie within the transverse of the ramp. In the case of thousand pound bombs, it is permissible to stack them in double tiers. And as the bombs arrive with transit rings and bases, it is in this case necessary to remove them before stacking. The procedure of unloading is exactly the same, except that the battens are laid from the ramp onto the top of the first tier. It is important to see that chocking is properly carried out to prevent sudden and dangerous displacement. When rolling bombs from single tier stacks onto trolleys, a C-type trolley is first wheeled into position. It should arrive parallel with and as near alongside the ramps as possible. And the first pair of cross members should lie opposite the ends of the batten. Next, remove the chocks on the near side of the trolley. Remove the wooden chocks from against the first bomb, and as the bomb is moved out, they are replaced in position against the second bomb in the row, and so on. When rolling the bomb onto the trolley, it occasionally happens that the lug impinges onto the edge of the trolley. It will then be necessary to roll the bomb backwards and rotate it very slightly. This is done by means of two roller chocks placed against the chocks already holding the remainder of the bomb. A firm hold for roller chocks is thus assured. The bomb can then be easily and smoothly rolled onto the cross members. If, however, as frequently happens, the lug is not in the upright position, 
it is again necessary to revolve the bomb. To do this, the offside chocks are temporarily removed and replaced with roller chocks, which facilitate turning. When the lug is in the upright position, the roller chocks are removed and the plane chocks replaced. The plane chock should be firmly secured in position, so make quite certain that each securing pin is properly inserted and fixed. A second pair of chocks are taken from the bin and fixed to hold the bomb in position. Then a further pair are set ready to receive the second bomb. The second bomb of the forward load is rolled on. If necessary, it should be rotated in a similar manner and the near side plane chocks inserted as previously shown. Again, don't forget to make the plane chocks safe and fix the securing pins properly. The trolley is then pulled forward so that the rear cross members are in alignment and the same procedure is followed in loading the two rear bombs. In rolling bombs onto a trolley from double tier stacks, the following procedure should be followed. Again, a C-type trolley is wheeled alongside the bay. A rope is anchored to the front bomb of the bottom tier. Make absolutely sure that the knot is firmly tied. A slip knot is the best. The rope is passed over and round the bomb to be loaded. Two ramps are then placed in position against the bottom tier and the two chocks removed. The rope forms an effective break when slowly released by one man. The other two men steady the bomb down to the floor level. The procedure is then exactly the same for loading onto trolleys as in the case of a bomb taken from single tiers. Remember that two chocks must be firmly wedged in the front of the bomb immediately behind the one which is to be rolled down in order that the man releasing the rope stands on a firm foundation. To ensure turnover of stock, it is necessary to load the trolley with bottom tier bombs as well. As soon as a reasonable number of bombs have been used from the top tier. This usually when single lengths of battens have been freed from the top weight. When bombs, in preparing a thousand MC bombs for long delay fusing, it is first necessary to examine the pistol which must be used. In this case, a 53. Here is one section for instructional purposes. First, we have the arming fork, which is rotated by means of veins and impinges upon and crushes the glass ampoule containing acetone. The acetone thus released softens the celluloid disc, which holds up a spring-loaded striker. The striker then descends and explodes the detonator. Notice, only one type of pistol to be brought into and used at any one time in this fusing shed. Remove the press cap on the top. Next, remove safety plate and examine the white blotting paper for stains would show if the acetone ampoule has been accidentally cracked or broken. Turn upside down to ensure that any free acid will descend onto the blotting paper. If there is any sign of stains, pistol should not be used. Examine the arming fork. 
checking that it is not bent or otherwise damaged. Do not, however, in any circumstances rotate it. Replace the safety plate and then the press cap. Remove the black ebonite cup and examine the locking ring, making sure the locking tab is present and undamaged. Check condition of the leather washer. Clean thread thoroughly. And then test with tool PG2547. Next, see that the striker is present and ensure that it is free of dirt. Also that grub screw is present. Replace Bakelite cup and the pistol is ready for use. Remember that in fusing, double checking of the pistol is necessary both in the fusing shed and at dispersal. The actual fusing is done at dispersal. But here is the general procedure. First remove tail pistol or plug and Wipe bomb thread thoroughly. Always remove existing pistols or plugs to their boxes in order to avoid any possible mistake with the delay pistol. Test bomb threads with tool PG1211. Take cavity gauge number two, mark one. Note marking for the 1000 MC bomb. Insert into the exploder pocket and make certain that the pocket is free of obstruction and of the correct depth to receive detonator. Then insert the detonator. Again remove the press cap and safety plate and check that no stain of any kind is present. Replace safety plate and press cap. These precautions taken, screw the pistol in to the bomb. The tail used with the 1,000 pound MC bomb is the number 37 Mark II. The ordinary tail vein is replaced by a red vein for pistols with less than one hour delay. The original vein is removed. First remove the arming wire, then back the locking washer. Remove the nuts and the locking washer and the vein comes off. Fix on the red vein. Replace the two parts of the washer. Replace nuts and tighten. Bend back tab and replace arming wire. Insert copper wire, which gives additional safety. Attached to this is an instruction label. Immediately before fixing tail, remove the press cap and the safety plate. Offer up the tail unit so that the arming forks engage. In other words, they must not be in alignment. Otherwise, they will foul one another 
and the ampoule will not be crushed by the rotation of the vein. See that the positioning slot engages properly with the positioning stud. Secure tail unit to bomb by means of four attached bolts. Finally, mark the bomb in red paint. FZD LD 53. That is fused, long delay, pistol 53. The bomb is then ready for delivery to aircraft. This film will demonstrate the method of loading 1,000 pound bombs, fused long delay, onto a Lancaster aircraft. Bombs fused long delay are always the last to be loaded onto an aircraft. They are also conveyed from the fusing area to the aircraft, separately from the rest of the load. They should be checked to ensure that they are marked with red paint, signifying the number of the pistol and that they are fused long delay. Ensure that the safety clip and wire are in position, locking the arming vanes to the tail unit, and that the labels are attached. The precautions about to be demonstrated. Here is the five pin plug being removed from the flare chute. This would normally have been carried out prior to commencing any loading operations, together with the testing of the bomb release circuit. The safety switch on the navigator's table is set to off, and the main fuse in the release circuit removed. The ground flight switch is set to ground, Starter trolley disconnected to ensure that the electrical circuit is not energized. See that the jettison bars are at safe and that all selector switches are off. Fusing switch is off and the bomb firing switch towed. The T35 camera and photo flash control mechanism is disconnected as a final precaution to prevent accidental release of the photo flash. The trolley with the bombs is positioned beneath the stations on the aircraft to which they will be loaded. Each carrier housing cover is removed and the five pin plug is disconnected from the aircraft supply socket and placed in the housing on the carrier. The carrier crutch is now raised and the carrier released by lifting the safety catch and releasing the pole. The carrier can easily be lifted down from this position and the release unit is cocked and the carrier is placed in position on the bomb. The carrier crutches are raised to their full extent to enable the hook of the release slip to engage with the bomb lug. The crutches are now adjusted, without using undue force, to stabilize the bomb. The fuse setting control link is now inserted into the fusing unit. The winch socket is rotated into position and the winch cable withdrawn from the winch and passed through the socket down to the carrier beneath. 